In this lesson, we're going to learn about a nice way to use the tabula recta uh, combined with a keyword to create a really strong cipher known as the visionaire cipher. Now, the visionaire cipher is somebody's name, but you'll notice it was not invented by somebody named visionaire. This idea was actually created by Giovanni Battista Balasso, which is a, an Italian person, and visionaire is French. Uh, but we'll see, this idea came around in about 1553 uh, in this booklet. You can actually find this copy uh, in the original Italian uh, online if you wanted to give it a look. And in it, as a system was described in which the tabula recta was used with the repeating countersign or keyword um, that would switch the cipher alphabet mapping after every single letter uh, in the message. So it was had a couple of benefits over the ones that we've seen so far with the tabula recta um, in that we can change the um, key very frequently, which will be helpful, we'll see, for cryptanalysis purposes. Um, and it's also just really easy to remember a long keyword uh, and that you can agree upon with somebody ahead of time. So easy to implement, easy to remember the key, and a very secure. Now, why is it called the Visionaire Cipher if it was named, uh, if it was invented by Balasso? And that's because Blaise de Visionaire had a kind of an improved version of it that we'll learn later on in this course called the Auto Key Cipher, um, which is just a kind of a variation on this one. And that's the one that got to be better known. And as a result, uh, the original was misattributed uh, to Visionaire as well uh, when it was really Belasso's. Um, this was really kind of the uh, encryption of its day um, back back in the 1500s. And because it was so secure and easy to implement, um, it was it was called Le Chiffre Indechiffrable, which, uh, pardon my poor French, but basically just means the unbreakable cipher. Uh, and it wasn't until almost the late 1800s here, 1863, when Friedrich Kosicki uh, was the first to publish a successful general attack on the Visionaire cipher, even though Charles Babbage, which might be a name that you're familiar with for uh, computing history, uh, had been known to have broken the cipher uh, on occasion earlier than that date. Uh, Kosicki was the first one who really published the method that you could use on, on any message that you had uh, found. So let's take a look at the Visionaire Cipher. Uh, we're going to start with a key word uh, of unicorn for NCSSM unicorns here. And uh, our plain text is a quote from Blaise de Visionaire. Uh, I saw Michelangelo at work. He had passed his 60th year, and although he was not very strong, uh, yet in a quarter of an hour he caused more splinters to fall from a very hard block of marble than three young masons in three or four times as long. So we're going to focus on just that first sentence, I saw Michelangelo at work. And let's see how we'll use that with the Visionaire Cipher. So we start by writing out our plain text with the keyword over the top. Clearly, the keyword is not long enough to go over the top of the entire message. So we'll just repeat that keyword as many times as necessary to fill it up. And just like we saw with the tabula recta, the reason why we need those letters over each other is that we can now use that table to identify the plain text letter, or the keyword letter, and find the intersection to get our cipher text or, if you prefer, you could do uh, essentially a Caesar cipher by taking your plain text numerical value and adding on the keyword numerical value and then modding by 26 to get to your cipher text letter. Um, and if you do that repeatedly, you'll get your cipher text. And that is it. That is the visionaire cipher. Everything about this is the same as our tabula recta method. It's really more about the keyword process that is unique. So we'll see it's that aspect of the keyword and that changing the key every single letter is what gives this cipher such strong security. So let's take a look at why it actually does that right now. All right, so we have a similar setup here. We've got our plain text message and we have a key. The key is only three letters long and repeats over and over. And to help us understand how this message is going to appear in the ciphertext, specifically the frequency of those characters, we're going to focus on just looking at certain groupings of characters at a time. So for example, let's look at all of the plain text letters that get encrypted when U is the letter above them. So if we were to encrypt all of those, we'd get this group, C, M, L, B, C, L, F, and so on. And if we focus on just those letters of the ciphertext and create a bar chart to take a visual inspection of the frequencies, we'll see that this frequency is chart looks very similar to the English language. In fact, it looks like the English language shifted over such that A is over U and E is over Y, which makes sense. If we think about just those letters, even though they are not English, uh, C, M, L, B, and even if you were to just take the plain text corresponding, it would not create English words with a large enough 
uh, sample of our plain text or cipher text, it will follow this kind of normal English distribution. And if we're looking at the cipher text, it will be shifted as a result. And again, that should also make sense because if we think about, well, how did we encrypt all of those plain text letters? We are basically just doing a Caesar cipher on each of those letters. So it shouldn't be surprising that the bar chart of those encrypted letters looks just like the bar chart that we saw when we we're working with the Caesar cipher. We get the same thing if we just focus on the characters that were encrypted using the key letter N. Those letters show up, and if you look at just those letters, look at that. Their distribution looks just like a English distribution, just shifted such that A is over N and E is over R. And probably not surprising that the last group here does the exact same thing for uh, the letter I. However, if we take all of these letters and group them together, so we're not looking at just little subsets of the ciphertext, but the whole thing, its bar chart for the frequency is very different. You'll see that we don't have any of those spikes that we saw in the previous bar charts. They're all pretty uniform. A couple letters are still lower and a couple letters a little bit higher, but really everything is below 8% and most letters are above 2%. We've kind of flattened out the bar chart here, which kind of makes sense. If you think about those three previous bar charts, they had their dips and valleys uh, and the spikes and different letters. So when we put all of those groupings together, they're going to kind of average each other out a little bit. Let's take a look at just one more to really drive this home. So here we've extended out the keyword uh, to unis with an S on the end, same plain text. So we'll go ahead and do the first group of characters, the ones that were encrypted with U. It has this bar chart, again, Caesar, A is now over U. And then we have our second grouping of characters, Caesar, A is over N. Third grouping looks like Caesar with an A over the I. And our last grouping, Caesar with the A over the S. So each of those kind of subgroups of characters each have a recognizable histogram, or bar chart rather. But when we group them all together, combine all the letters of the ciphertext, things are even more evened out. Look at this, all of them are below 6%. And almost all of them, just save one or two letters maybe, are above 2%. We've truly flattened this out. And it turns out, the, as we lengthen the key to more and more letters, the more and more uniform the distribution of our ciphertext is going to become. So this is where all that security is going to come in play, is that our frequency analysis that we've been using to crack messages really seems to be at a loss here. We can't pick up frequent characters in the ciphertext because they're all about as frequent, which for keeping your message secure, that's great. But as for us trying to break messages, that's going to make things a little bit more challenging. And there's a reason why this one stuck around for a couple hundred years as the cipher of the day is that it requires a little bit more sophistication mathematically to help us figure out how to crack that message. So that's it for the Visionaire cipher. We're going to learn a little bit of some twists we can put on the Visionaire to strengthen it even more than what we've seen. Um, and then we'll actually see an example where we could make this cipher 100% uncrackable um, using something what's called a one-time pad. We'll see there's some drawbacks to that method, but it is mathematically secure.